The AP often disguises initial value problems as physics problems. For example, at time t greater than or equal to zero, the acceleration of a particle moving on the x-axis is t plus sine t. At t equals zero, the velocity of the particle is negative two. For what value t will the velocity of the particle be zero? Well, they're asking us for what value of t v is going to be equal to zero. Well, they actually haven't given us our velocity function. They gave us our acceleration function, which means that we have to go from acceleration to velocity, which means we have to take an integral. However, if we just took the antiderivative of t plus sine t, we would have a c involved somewhere, and there would have a, a family of antiderivatives. The AP gets out of this by giving us an initial condition for velocity, namely that at time t equals zero, the velocity is negative two. Now that gives us a very specific antiderivative, and then we can use that function and set that equal to zero. Now, if you're good at this, you know that the antiderivative of acceleration gives you velocity. So of course you could just find the antiderivative of acceleration right off the bat. However, for some of you who say, wait a minute, you can't do that because the integral of t plus sine t doesn't make sense. You have to have a dt somewhere in there. And of course, we can make that happen. We can do that, and you don't have to do this every time. I'm just showing you the math involved that explains why we're allowed to just take the antiderivative willy-nilly. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. It is dv dt. That is another way of expressing a. So dv dt is equal to t plus sine of t. And this is why we're allowed to take the antiderivative, because we can multiply both sides by dt, yielding dv is equal to quantity t plus sine t dt. And of course, now we can take the integral of both sides. Now the antiderivative of dv, that's just v. The antiderivative of t plus sine t, this is 1 half t squared minus cosine t plus c. Now, of course, at this point, we can use our initial condition to figure out what c is. And they told us here that at time t equals 0, the velocity is negative 2. In other words, v of 0 is negative 2. So we can plug 0 into t. We can plug negative 2 into v, and that will allow us to solve for c. So let's do that. Here we have negative 2 is equal to, this cancels out. Cosine of 0 is positive 1, but we've got a negative in front, so that's negative 1 plus c. And of course, this means that c is equal to negative 1. So our particular velocity function, v of t, is 1 half t squared minus cosine t minus 1. Now let's go back and read the problem. They are asking us for what value of t the velocity is going to be 0. So at this point, I can just set my velocity function equal to 0 and use a graphing calculator to find the zeros of this particular function. It turns out that the zeros are at plus or minus 1.478. Of course, they've restricted our domain of t to be just 0 and above. So we're only going to include the positive value of t. And so at t is equal to 1.478, that is when the velocity of this particle is equal to 0. The acceleration of a particle moving along the x-axis at time t is given by a of t is equal to 6t minus 2. If the velocity is 25 when t is equal to 3, and the position is 10 when t is equal to 1, then the position x of t is equal to what? We are asked to go from acceleration 
all the way up to position. Now luckily they've given us a couple of initial conditions. They gave us the initial value of velocity, 3 comma 25, as well as position, 1 comma 10. And so we're going to have to do an IVP problem twice. So here we go. If the acceleration is 16 minus 2, then you take the antiderivative to get up to velocity, that's going to be 3t squared minus 2t plus c. Now they've given us that v of 3 is equal to 25. Now we're going to have to take the antiderivative again to find position, and our c's might get confusing. So I'm going to call this c1. That's my first c, just so we can, we can distinguish the c for velocity and the c for position. So here we have c1. Let's solve for c1 using our initial condition, 3 comma 25. If I plug 25 into my velocity and 3 into t, 3 squared is 9 times 3 is 27, minus 2 times 3, that's minus 6, plus c1. And this, of course, yields that c1 is equal to, let's see, 27 minus 6 is 21, 25 minus 21 is 4. And so my particular velocity function is given by 3t squared minus 2t plus 4. Now let's go through this all over again to go up to position. Let's take the antiderivative yet again. So here we have x of t, my position, is given by the antiderivative of velocity. So this is t cubed minus t squared, that was pretty handy, plus 4t plus c. I'm going to call this c2 because this is my second value of c, completely unrelated to the c for velocity. And furthermore, they've given us that the position is 10 when t is equal to 1. In other words, x of 1 is equal to 10. So let's plug that in now. So here we have 10 is equal to 1 minus 1 plus 4 plus c2. And 10 minus 4 is 6, and this of course yields that our second constant c is equal to 6. And therefore, our position function, x of t, is equal to t cubed minus t squared plus 4t plus 6. And that is the answer to this. We went all the way from acceleration up to position.